All right. Okay, so I think we have, yeah, only around 16 attendees for now, but I think um, the figure will um, come up later in the, once we go along with the program. So um, good morning, good afternoon, um, everyone. Welcome to the 14th Pan-Asia Farmers Exchange Program. This is the day four of the five-day webinar that we will be holding until tomorrow, November 20. Our session for today is about the experiences in commercial growing of biotech crops. And I am your moderator for today. I am Maria M. Ruby Rodriguez. You can call me Mimi for short. I am the vice chair of the Crop Life Philippines Seeds Committee and currently the Seeds and Treats Regulatory Manager of Syngenta Philippines. I would like to welcome all the participants from Asia Pacific, namely um, Australia, China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, India, and Pakistan. Okay, so um, before I introduce to you our first speaker, let me just give some points to remember during the um, duration of this program. First, um, please type your questions at the Q&A section anytime. So just a reminder, um, we would really appreciate if you can first um, find the chat, not the chat box, but the Q&A box. So it's um, at the bottom of your screen um, after the near the participants tab. So kindly um, write your questions there uh, anytime during the uh, duration of the program. And then secondly, the questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If there are questions that are not accommodated or answered during the session due to time constraint, this will be answered through our Q&A box by our resource speakers or via email. And then thirdly, um, e-certificates will be given only to participants who will be able to attend the five-day program. Certificates will be sent to your registered email address. Number four, so same as yesterday, there will be a $20 question at the end of the session. So please stay until our session ends. Okay, so hopefully those, um, um, those housekeeping rules or reminders um, are fine with you. Okay, now, so let us now proceed um, with the session proper. So I am excited to tell you that our speakers for today are farmers, which are considered as our modern day heroes. We also refer to them as our frontliners, especially during this challenging time of pandemic. Our dear farmers come from Australia, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and Pakistan. They will be sharing their own experiences in growing biotech crops. So for our first speaker, um, our first speaker is a dryland broadacre farmer from Great Southwestern, Great Southern Western Australia. Um, the farming runs in uh, her family. So alongside with her um, husband, sister, brother-in-law, and parents, her family business owns and manages 9,000 hectares and produces canola, wheat, barley, oats, hay, wool, and sheep, predominantly for the export market. Our speaker believes that the science is the heart of agriculture. Her involvement in advocacy has been an important aspect of her career, including issues such as access to GM technology and live export. She has held roles as a policy director, pastoral lease and grazers association committee member, and has involvement in national policy issues. So to share her experience in growing GM canola, let us all welcome back Miss Belinda Murray, or you may call her Bindi. So Bindi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today and share some of my experience. So I will hopefully master the technology and share my screen. Oh, sorry. I will just have to go back to the start. One second, sorry.
my apologies for that. Now we have my screen. <laughs> my apologies. So my presentation is about GM canola technology in our farming business. And that's a picture from one of the higher points on our farm. So just to give you some context about where we farm, um, this is a map showing sort of the inherent um, soil quality across the world. And you can see that the pink and the white areas are the areas of low, inherently low soil fertility. And the arrow points to where we are, which is one of the pink areas. So one of the big challenges for us is our ancient soils, which have low levels of fertility and also water holding capacity. We also have limited rainfall. So because we're dry land, uh, rain fed, the timing and amount of rain that we receive is the key driver of our annual production. And we also have a very narrow window called our growing season. And that's the time where there is um, enough moisture for us to plant um, and for the plants to grow and establish before the soil temperature drops. So this is just uh, the last 10 years showing the variation in our growing season rainfall. So you can see 142 millimetres in our growing season is the lowest, up to 432. And in those years, waterlogging can become an issue. So this just gives you a bit more information about our farm. The very small pin that you can see gives you the location within uh, Western Australia and Australia. And then the Google Earth shows you that our farm is actually, you may see the circles there, it's part of a very old um, river system and it's very variable. So within our farm, we have everything from deep white, low fertile soils up to rich chocolate loams. So the total area of our farm is 9,000 hectares, but the productive area is 6,700. And within that each year, we have about 3,500 to 4,000 hectares for cropping. And the remainder we use as pastures and we use them to produce livestock for sheep, meat and for wool. So within our cropping enterprise, uh, it is dry land. So rain fed, there is no, um, no irrigation at all. And that is common basically for the entire state. The area of crops that we grow, we only grow crops in winter. We don't really have, it's a Mediterranean climate. So we don't have enough rainfall to produce any more than one crop per year. Um, and the area of crop that we grow varies depending on the agronomic rotation and also on the forecast gross margins and profits for each of the crop types. And our season runs from the break of the season around the 25th of May, and then normally we harvest our crops. We're harvesting now, um, actually harvesting canola right now, um, and we harvest at the start of November. So uh, last time uh, when I got to speak to the, uh, the Farmers Exchange, people were very interested in the, um, the canola operations. So what we have here is uh, in the top left hand corner is our planting. And you can see that there, this has been planted before the rain. So there is no germination. And this is where GM canola is absolutely important for us because we don't have any tillage. We go straight into the paddock and plant um, and, and, and no tillage is required. And, and we rely on chemical control to be able to protect our, our um, crops once they're planted. From, um, from weeds and diseases. So you can see in the next picture there that sort of shows our entire team. So that's our, our entire farm staff, plus there are a few small children from my family in there as well. Um, but it's quite a small staff uh, for the number of, um, for the amount of activity that we do. And then also in the background, you can see there our self-propelled boom spray. Um, so the boom spray has a spray width of 36 meters. And it's very busy and our main tool that we have to protect our crops uh, and let them grow well during the growing season. And then in the, the bottom left hand corner, you can see canola there, which we've cut and placed into a swath to allow it to dry, but protect uh, the pod and allow it to stay um, protected in case we have any unseasonal rain or hail events. Because the other picture, which you can see we're using a, a harvester to direct head it. If we have unseasonal rain, it can be subject to shedding and the shedding can cost you up to um, uh, a tonne per hectare in terms of yield loss. 
So the role of GM canola in our system, it's absolutely crucial for weed control, and that's both in the short term and also in the long term. So resistance is an issue because I've said, instead of relying on tillage, we rely on in-crop chemical control. So managing and combating resistance is really important. In the last two years, we purchased a new farm and with that new land, we also, um, we also managed to get a whole lot of uh, weed burden and some very big resistance issues. So GM canola is going to be a crucial part of that system until we're able to break the back of that resistance issue. It also gives us great rotation between broadleaf and cereals. So dry sowing, which I've already mentioned, is a complete game changer in our drying climate. So it's now standard practice to dry sow our canola due to the, our ability to control ryegrass in crop. It's also really important for paddocks that are returning from pasture into crop because they've been able to naturally grow and develop over those two years, there can be quite a variety of weeds in there. It's also really important for paddocks where hay is not a suitable rotation. So uh, the cutting of hay and oat and hay requires uh, a very flat, very consistent topography in the paddocks and not all, all of our paddocks are able to do this. And the really key thing for us is that we're able to spell grass selective herbicides. They've become under a huge pressure for resistance in Western Australia. And we can use Roundup Ready canola to set up the paddocks for long-term sustainable cropping rotations. There are, however, some risks with GM canola in our system. And one of the things is that it does have a higher input cost at the start. And that mainly relates to the seed because you're paying for the technology upfront rather than paying for uh, increased fertilizer and so on and inputs afterwards. It does shift the cost to the very start of the season. So quite often we're, as a business, we're taking those costs on before we even know whether we will have enough rain to sustain the crop or whether the crop will fail. One of the other things with the West Australian system is that our main grain handler does segregate between CAG, which is genetically modified canola, and CAN, which is traditional canola. So we have to make sure that all of our processes and systems and record keeping ensures that we keep that segregation, not just on farm, but also all the way through to delivery and contracting of our grain. And because in the system, we have the split between the CAN and the CAG, um, in, in our environment, there is normally a higher price for the conventional canola because it has uh, other markets. And we never know what the spread will be. So how much the difference between those two prices for CAG and CAN will be at the time of sowing. And it varies a lot by the time of sowing. So this is some information about the canola performance on our farm. So we grow three types of canola. We grow a very small amount of hybrid, which is the purple column. And then the main two things that we grow is conventional canola in the blue and the GM canola in the teal color. So the yield on this year was not very good because we had a lot of, we had a heat stress event and a drying event in spring. And you can see that it had a really big impact. The GM canola performed incredibly well. And so one of the things that you would look at this and say, well, it's quite obvious, you should be growing all GM canola. However, when we look at some of the other aspects, you can see from the, the graph on the left-hand side, which is the farm gate pricing. So the price that we receive on farm. And you can see there's quite a difference between that the spread that I was talking about between the can and the CAG is quite big. So you can also see on the far right hand side, the variable costs. There is a higher cost to us to grow uh, canola, to grow the GM canola, but we have a much higher income. So it's about risk management for us, including it in making sure we include both conventional and GM canola in our programs. So in summary, we have been growing GM canola for five years now, and it's an incredibly useful tool to have in our toolbox. We also are very happy now to have the government restrictions that were specific to our state removed so that we know with confidence we will be able to grow GM canola into the future. It's really important and it increases our sustainability and farm, of our farming practices in our drying climate. Thank you very much for listening and for taking the time to hear my story. Thank you, Bindi. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation and um, 
you never get tired of um, being with us in the Farmers Exchange. Um, thank you for sharing the how how useful gem canola is in the Australia. Okay, okay. yeah, just stay put for the Q and A later. Um, moving on to the next, um, we'll be presenting a video about the PT Perke Bunan. Nusantara 11, so hopefully I pronounce it correctly. <laughs> it's a government-owned estate whose main business activity is the production of sugar. They are also involved in the production of alcohol and spirits from molasses and the production of gunny sacks from canna fiber and plastic sacks. And now, um, Mr. Alex Ducmanto and Dr. Normala Darsono of the PTPN and the Biotech Seeds Director of CropLife Indonesia, Mr. Alex Soherman, will now take us for a quick virtual tour for us to learn about Indonesia's um, GM sugar cane. So now let's play the video, please. PT Perkebunan Nusantara 11 merupakan salah satu anak perusahaan dari PT Perkebunan Nusantara 3 Holding Perkebunan yang berdiri sejak tahun 1996 dengan komoditas utama berupa produk gula dan turunannya. Berkantor pusat di Surabaya, Jawa Timur mencakup 15 pabrik gula, satu pabrik karung, satu pabrik alkohol dan spiritus, serta satu unit usaha strategis yang tersebar di wilayah Jawa Timur. PT Perkebunan Nusantara 11 memiliki visi menjadi perusahaan agroindustri yang unggul di Indonesia dengan tujuan untuk memberikan pelayanan terbaik demi kesejahteraan bersama. Guna mendukung ketahanan pangan di Indonesia, PT Perkebunan Nusantara 11 melalui Pusat Penelitian Sukosari di Lumajang mengembangkan tebu transgenik sebagai solusi untuk permasalahan lahan kering sehingga mampu mendapatkan produktivitas lebih baik dibandingkan tebu konvensional. PT Perkebunan Nusantara 11 merupakan salah satu anak perusahaan dari PT Perkebunan Nusantara 3 Holding dengan komoditas utama berupa produk gula dan turunannya. Saat ini, PT Perkebunan Nusantara 11 telah mengembangkan tebu transgenik yang diteliti lebih dari 10 tahun dan sudah diaplikasikan pada lahan milik sendiri serta telah mendapatkan sertifikasi secara resmi pada tahun 2019. Seperti yang kita ketahui, permasalahan terjadi pada lahan sawah pertanian yang biasanya ditanami tebu telah beralih fungsi menjadi pemukiman atau kawasan industri sehingga dibutuhkan tebu yang tahan pada lahan kering atau berpengairan kurang. Harapan kami ke depan, tebu transgenik ini menjadi salah satu solusi untuk lahan kering, sehingga bisa memenuhi kebutuhan tebu giling di lingkungan PT Perkebunan Nusantara 11, serta mendukung tercapainya ketahanan pangan nasional. Selain itu, besar harapan kami agar tebu transgenik ini nantinya dapat diterima oleh petani secara luas guna memajukan industri gula di Indonesia. Selamat pagi, salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Nama saya Alex Bukmanto dari Club Life Indonesia. Saat ini di pagi yang cerah, dengan latar belakang gunung, kita berada di wilayah Sukosari, Kabupaten Lumajang. Proplek Indonesia bekerja sama dengan PT Perkebunan Nusantara 11 membuat video ini sebagai media edukasi bahwa kita Indonesia telah mampu mengembangkan produk rekasa genetik. Hadir bersama saya pada pagi hari ini salah seorang karyawan dari PT PN 11 yang akan bercerita banyak tentang kondisi perkebunan tebu biotek yang ada di PT PN 11. Dengan Bapak siapa? Boleh diperkenalkan? Perkenalkan Pak, nama saya Deni Bagus Surendra dari PT Perkebunan Nusantara 11. Saya bekerja di PT Perkebunan Nusantara 11 sejak tahun 2010. Kami di Pusit Sukasari mengelola tebu pembenihan, ya, termasuk tebu bibit produk rekasa genetik. Lalu untuk area ini kira-kira luasnya berapa hektar ya Pak? Untuk tebu 
biotech ini yang kami kelola di Puslit Sokosari semenjak tahun 2019 itu kami tanam sekitar 1,5 hektar dan nanti itu bisa dijadikan untuk tebu giling sekitar 1.900 hektar pak. Baik. Itu untuk memenuhi kebutuhan dari unit pabrik gula se PT PN11. Jadi sejak tahun 2019 ya pak ya? Iya pak, karena sejak tahun 2019 sertifikat resmi dari UPT telah diterbitkan. Sekarang saya sedang berada di pusat penelitian PT PN11 tempat di mana penelitian tentang tebu biotek dilakukan, tepatnya berada di Laboratorium Kultur Jaringan. Mari ikuti saya. Saya mau mewawancari salah satu toko kunci di belakang layar yang merupakan riset utama dalam pengembangan tebu biotek di Indonesia. Mari kita ikuti. Selamat pagi, permisi, mau pa mengganggu. Pagi Pak Alek. Dengan siapa kami berbicara, boleh dikenalkan kepada teman-teman. Oke, okay. saya Nani Trismati, Kepala Puslit Sukosari PT PN11. Mungkin ada yang bisa saya membantu. Tolong dijelaskan ke kita, Bu, terkait riset biotek di tempat ini seperti apa. Oke, okay, baik. Mari ikut saya, Pak Alek. Pak Alek, ini lab kultur jaringan Puslit Sukosari PT PN11. Tebu transgenik kita miliki mulai dari jenjang tinggi. Pengen tahu sejarahnya? Ini diteliti 10, lebih dari 10 tahun. Dari tahun 1999, kita kerjasama dengan PT Adilomoto. Diteliti selama 10, 11 tahun. Kita adakan penelitian, baru tahun 2013 dirilis. Tahun 2010, kita mulai pengembangan pembibitan dan penelitian. Tahun 2011, kita mendapatkan izin dari KLH tentang keamanan Hayati. Tahun 2012, kita mendapatkan izin sertifikat keamanan pangan. Tahun 2013, kita baru rilis. Tetapi perjalanannya belum berhenti di situ, Pak Alek. Tahun 2018, kita baru mendapatkan uh, sertifikat keamanan pangan. Dan tahun 2019, baru kita mendapatkan sertifikat pembibitan. Baru setelah itu, kita boleh resmi mendistribusikan ini baik ke TS maupun ke TS. Lalu alasan PT PN11 mengembangkan riset tebu biotek ini didasari oleh apa ya Bu? Ada dua alasan PT PN11 mengembangkan ini. Kita memandang ke depan. Satu, lahan perkebunan untuk komoditas tebu semakin hari semakin bergeser dari sawah ke lahan tegal. Artinya harus ada varietas yang tahan kering karena luasan tegal semakin banyak. Kedua, baik itu di lahan sawah pun mengalami kendala. Kendalaannya adalah keterbatasan sumber air, sehingga di sawah pun membutuhkan varietas yang tahan kering. Itu alasannya, itu alasan. Luar biasa, Bu. Tolong dijelaskan dong ke saya, ini keunggulan produk riset tebu biotek dibandingkan dengan yang konvensional itu seperti apa? Apa yang mencolok dari sini? Baik, keunggulan dari transgenik tahan kering adalah di dalam varietas ini, kita sisipi gen G betain. Dia punya karakter bisa membentuk panjang akar lebih panjang, lalu distribusi perakaran lebih luas, sehingga volume akar lebih besar atau lebih banyak daripada e, indukan aslinya. Sehingga sama-sama jenis BL misalnya, BL transgenik, dia akan mempunyai daya tahan kering karena akarnya lebih panjang dan lebih luas daerah perakarannya. Terima kasih banyak Ibu untuk penjelasannya luar biasa. Tentunya Ibu punya harapan untuk riset tebu biotek di Indonesia akan seperti apa atau mau dibawa ke mana ini tebu biotek? Karena kita sejak penelitian menunjukkan membuktikan bahwa tebu biotek ini, tebu transgenik ini mempunyai produktivitas yang lebih tinggi. Kami berharap setelah semuanya resmi legal, kita akan kembangkan untuk semua masyarakat pertebuan di Indonesia. Kita akan mulai kembangkan dari lab ini. Kita mulai dari bibit jenjang tinggi sampai nanti ke tebu giling. Mungkin itu demi kemajuan pergulaan di Indonesia. Sekarang saya sudah berpindah ke lokasi kebun HGU Jatiroto, Kabupaten Lumajang. Di pagi yang cerah ini sedang ada pekerja kebun yang sedang mengelola tebu biotek. Juga nanti akan mendampingi saya, Kepala Kebun Wilayah Tiroto. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. Dengan Bapak siapa ini saya berbicara? Perkenalkan, nama saya Bayu Nugroho. Saya sudah bergabung di PT Perkebunan Nusantara 11, masuk tahun ke-8. Dan saya sudah mengelola 
Kita buat biotek masuk tahun kedua. Pak Bayu di kawasan kebun HGU TTPN 11 ini luasnya berapa hektar Pak yang sudah ditanami tebu biotek? Oh, untuk luas total yang saya kelola sekitar 500 hektar. Saya di wilayah Sukosari, saya mengelola sekitar 11 hektar tebu biotek. Untuk kawasan kebun yang dikelola sama Pak Bayu, ada berapa pekerja Pak? Untuk di kebun Sukosari wilayah timur, saya memiliki 5 mandor. Setiap mandor memiliki 30 pekerja seperti ini. Jadi praktis saya membawai sekitar 150 orang pekerja. Boleh diceritakan kepada kita Pak, perbedaan yang cukup signifikan antara tebu konvensional dengan tebu biotek, seperti apa Pak kondisinya? Kebetulan sekali kita sekarang berada di tengah-tengah antara tebu biotek dan tebu konvensional. Yang pertama masalah tipologi wilayah Sukosari dulu. Sukosari sendiri ini termasuk tanah tegal, tebu biotek yang kita kembangkan memang terkhusus untuk di tanah tegal. Dia akan muncul kelebihannya, itu pada saat di tanah, ditanam di tanah yang kering, termasuk Sukosari. Untuk yang kedua masalah morfologi. Di bulan yang sama, di tahun kemarin, yang tebu biotek ini jauh sekali lebih hijau daripada yang konvensional. Untuk yang terakhir, protas. Untuk yang tebu biotek, protas per hektar 127,4 ton per hektar. Untuk tebu konvensional, 98,7 ton per hektar. Saya rasa ini cukup, cukup signifikan ya. Tebu Transgenic Indonesia! Yes, yes, yes! Alright, um, thank you um, Indonesia team for that very educational video. Um, thank you Mr. Alex, Dr. Normala, and the PTPN team. Um, so we saw um, the importance of the sh um, GM sugar cane in terms of the survival in the dry field and also due to the um, limited um, source of water. So for now, um, let's have this um, time for the Q&A uh, for our two presentations. Um, May we call Ms. Bindi and um, Dr. Um, Norma Ladersona, the principal researcher of the GM Sugarcane. Um, so let me check first the question. So <clears throat> for the first question, it's from Mr. Asif Salim Shah. This is for Bindi. Okay. So um, Bindi, please explain more about the mechanical harvesting of canola. Thank you. Thank you. So there are two ways that we can do it. And there was one picture in my presentation where you saw the canola was sitting in a long row. We have a machine that comes across uh, and the width of that is about 12 meters. And it cuts the plant and then brings it together into a row and places it on the ground with the stalks facing in one direction. And this allows it to dry, but also because it's very brittle and the seeds will shed very easily. When it dries, the pod stays nice and, and solid and strong. So we leave that in, in the field to dry for at least 10 days, but it can be up to four weeks. At the end of that time, we have a, a, a um, harvester, mechanical harvester, and it has uh, first a, a drum that brings the product in, and then it, it has a concave. Apologies for my trying to show with my hand. It has a drum that spins around like this against a concave. And by rubbing the crop continuously, the seeds fall through and are caught underneath and separated um, and, and are shaken over a sieve, which allows us to separate the chaff and the, the, the plant stem product away from the individual seeds. So with the swath canola, we have a, sp a special head that is quite small and it has a belt that continuously feeds the windrows, the rows of canola up into the machine. But when we are direct having it, we have a 15 meter front and it has a knife section which moves, one bit holds the crop and the other move, the knife moves back and forward and it cuts it and then pushes it into the machine where it goes through the same separation process against the drum. And this allows us to store, it goes into the grain tank and is stored within the machine. And we will have two to three of these machines operating at one time in the field. And then we will have a, a, a chaser bin, which is a tractor with a small, um, a small container behind it. And it will drive up. And while they're, because it's so important for us to harvest quickly, they don't stop. And while they're both driving, they will drive next to each other and continue to drive while they unload and continue harvesting. So. We must continue to always harvest while the weather is appropriate for us to keep harvesting. And then from there, it is transferred into a truck and delivered into our bulk handling system. 
I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you, Bindi. So um, next question um, from um, Milin Damle. So this is for um, the Indonesia team. It's about the sugar cane. So the first question, um, what is the biotic stress tolerance technology of sugar cane with um, hectare meter water requirement? So I think um, um, Miss or Mr. Milind is asking for the requirements in terms of the um, water. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh... We don't, uh, we don't, um, uh, uh, we water the uh, sugarcane, GM sugarcane, uh, twice. Uh, first, first time in when the seed uh, in seed development, and uh, secondly, uh, when we apply fertilizer. So uh, we don't count the water meter requirement, uh, only two times during uh, uh, planting in fields. Uh, about the abiotic stress tolerance, uh, this GM sugarcane has a protein called betaine. Uh, this protein uh, function as a protection of cells. So the cells uh, still manage their water in this uh, cell so they don't dry even the climate getting dry. Uh, I think that's the answer. But uh, specifically, uh, I have some uh, presentation to to make our aud audience uh, get more comprehend about GM sugarcane. Uh, if I have some about ten minutes, uh, I I think I can uh, uh, explain uh, about it. Uh, uh, more, co more, uh, uh, more clearly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mala. Um, yeah. So, just for everyone's information, first, um, we can see your um, some of the questions are still um, the Q and A box. So, uh, we will try to answer these questions again um, via the Q and A box or via the email. So. Mr. Mala, um, yeah, I think you, you want to present a slide, right? So we can give you um, around five to 10 minutes for that. Would that be fine? Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Kindly share your screen. Okay, uh, I will explain to you about our GM sugarcane. Uh, the specific character is drought tolerance. Uh, this is the visual look of GM Mr. sugarcane. Excuse yeah. me, Bunur Mala, maybe you, can you share the presentation slide? Yeah. Okay, okay. Or maybe from the admin can set Ms. Darsono to become host so that she can present her slide deck. Can you um, please um, share it to Crop Live? Bowie, can you assist? Okay. Yeah, that's great. All right. Can see it now. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, can you please pr um, press the presentation um, yeah. bar? Yeah. Uh, next At the slide. Bottom. So at the bottom of your screen, um, there's like a range and then um, can you please present that? Yes, that one. All right. Okay, uh, this is the visual look of GM sugarcane. Uh, 
and this is our head office. And uh, this is our uh, working area uh, divided in three region, West region, Central region, and East region. All of this region is in East Java province. Uh, let's skip this. Okay. Uh, there is a increasing trend of usage dry land for sugarcane crops. So we need to uh, make some innovation in a uh, new variety which has a drought tolerance uh, character. And this is the productivity in dry land. And uh, the trend is decreasing uh, about 63 ton per hectare. And this is a brief information uh, that we about GM sugarcane uh, start from research in 1999 and the last certification that we have is uh, in 2018 that is a fit safety certification and this is the certification environment in 2011 uh, food safety 2012 uh, fit safety 2018 and uh, a patent yeah crop plant protection in 2016. And this is a visual look. So uh, we also conduct a public information. Let me skip this. Uh, this is a public information for farmers. And this is a farmer experimental field. Uh, we also conduct farmer experimental field in the year of 2014, 2016. And uh, this is a function as field school for farmers so they can learn and discuss uh, everything about GM sugarcane. And this is the public information that we conduct for journalists. And uh, this is, uh, so the impact of public information is uh, GM sugarcane is internationally known. So uh, we have some visitor from foreign sugar company such as from India and South Africa. And now let's see the performance of N1140. Uh, uh, during, during assessment period for uh, release, yeah, for commercial release of GM sugarcane, uh, we collect uh, many data. One of the data is stability index. Stability index, uh, I assume this data is uh, the productivity potency of GM sugarcane. So uh, in, uh, in biomass, uh, the productivity potency is around 79 ton per hectare and in sugar content is around 8.5. Uh, this is the data of the real productivity for the last four years in PTPN 11. Uh, you may see that the average uh, amount of biomass is about 76. This is very close, close enough to its potency, but and the sugar content uh, in average is 7.5 uh, compared to its potency is 8.5. So I think uh, in this sugar content parameter, uh, we need a lot of effort uh, to raise the, uh, the GM sugarcane uh, to raise the sugar content of GM sugarcane to its potency. Uh, I will show you the comparison data. Uh, if the GM sugarcane planting in dry zone, uh, left table is dry zone and right table is wet zone. Uh, in in our company, uh, we classified uh, climate zone with uh, all the all demand classification. Uh, the left table show us that uh, GM sugarcane uh, has higher biomass productivity in uh, dry zone, but uh, the sugar content uh, still lower than its potency because uh, the potency is 8.5, but in a uh, dry zone still 5.7. Uh, in the right table on the wet zone, uh, 
the biomass parameter is higher than its potency, but the sugar content still uh, lower. So uh, I suggest that we still need more effort uh, to uh, raise the uh, sugar content and then uh, it can achieve its potency. Uh, this data is a distribution of planting material of uh, GM sugarcane in the last four years. And I tried to uh, make some trend and we can see that, uh, this, that there is a increasing uh, trend of uh, planting material. So uh, we, we believe that uh, farmer interest uh, or user interest about this GM sugarcane is rising. So uh, in the next year, uh, we, we believe that the GM sugarcane uh, give benefit to farmer on uh, biomass and also on uh, sugar crystal. And uh, la the conclusion of our short presentation is N1140 biomass show stability for performance, uh, show stability performance in dry land, but sugar content is lower than its potency. So we need to increase uh, best practices in agricultural cultivation according to attain the stability index. And the second is uh, N1140 biomass still has good performance in irrigated fields. Uh, this is something obvious, uh, but the sugar content is still lower than its potency. Uh, so uh, I'm still suggesting that we need to uh, make a more effort to uh, in uh, apa, in agricultural cultivation to raise the sugar content. And thus, uh, the GM sugar cane is not recommended for irrigated fields. Uh, and the last thing, the third farmer interest on GM sugar cane is increasing. So this indicates the benefit of uh, this variety for farmer and uh, and for uh, production of sugar in PTPN 11. I think that's all uh, my presentation. Uh, I hope everyone have more information about GM sugarcane. And if any of you have some question or uh, discussion uh, let me uh, let me answer you in q and a or by email thank you very much for your attention and thank you again uh, miss normala so thank you for sharing the performance data and the further studies that you need to do for the gm um, sugar cane technology so for um, miss bindi and um, normala kindly check the q and a box again so we, we can um, start and um, continue answering the questions from from the participants okay so um, moving on with our program i'm now excited to introduce to you our next speaker so our next model farmer is a successful bt corn farmer from tarlac philippines so he advocates the use of bt corn because of its impact on his life. So let us now hear his story. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Mr. Juanito Kajani Rama. So here's the video. Ako si Juanito Kajani Rama ng San Miguel, San Manuel, Tarlac. Isang corn farmer po dito sa Central Luzon. At ako po ay 56 years old na po ngayon. Uh, nagsimula po akong uh, magtanim ng GM corn noong 2000, 2003. Uh, bale ang nag-ingganyo po sa akin ay isang mga seed company kung saan uh, sila po ang nakakimbento ng GM corn na ito para sa mga kagaya naming mga 
corn farmer dito sa Central Luzon. Nung una po ay nagdadaot po kami kasi maraming mga balibalita na ang GM corn daw ay masama sa ating uh, kagaya natin na kukonsol mo. Pero dahil po sa kami naman po ay uh, very open naman po kami mga corn farmer so hindi po kami gaano na nahirapan na nagsubok. Dahil nga nakita namin na siguro ito yung makakapagbigay sa amin ng magandang ani. Dahil nga nababalitan namin itong GM corn ay mas malaki po ang ani kumpara sa uh, ordinary corn. Nung una po kaming nagtatanim ng mais, uh, since 1988 po kami nag-start na nagmais, ay gumagamit lang po kami na binhi na ay ordinary corn. Although yun po ay may mga hybrid na po, kaya lang uh, ordinary, na, ordinary pa po yun bang uh, nilalagyan pa ng mga granule, nilalag inaisprayan pa po ng mga insecticide para makontrol po yung mga mapaminsala na kagaya ng corn borer. Nung unang nagtatanim po kami ng ordinary corn, ay nasubukan po namin na umani lang po ng walang, walong bag sa isang ektarya dahil nga doon sa pinsala na dulot ng corn borer. Nung sinubukan po namin, ang itong GM corn ay isa, medyo mataas ang Uh, puhunan ng binhi, pero nung umani po kami, nagulat po kami dahil uh, yung inaasahan namin na ani, kumpara doon sa dati ay mas higit pa sa doble yung inaani namin. Kaya yun po yung napakalaking naibigay ng GM corn para sa aming mga corn farmer. Mas doble po yung inaani po namin. Kasi po, uh, yung GM corn ay hindi na po inaatake ng uh, mga insikto, kagaya ng corn borer. Kung saan ang corn borer ay malaking kabawasan sa ani ng mga magsasaka. Kaya nung nagtanim na po kami ng GM corn, talagang 100% na po ay walang damage talaga. Kaya siguro masasabi natin na dumoble yung ani namin dahil nga hindi na uh, napinsala o nasira yung mga mais na tinanim natin. Yung Itinatanim po namin ngayon yung GM uh, corn, yung Roundup Ready corn, yun po yung ngayon yung uh, mayroon na siyang protection sa PAO, yung double pro na sinasabi nila, double protection na po yun. Malaki po ang pagbabago ng aming pamumuhay nung kami po ay nagtanim ng GM corn dahil nung ordinary pa lang po yung tinatanim namin ay halos uh, wala kaming kinikita taon-taon. Kung baga, uh, tama-tama lang sa aming pamumuhay, eh, mahirap pa po kami makapagpatayo ng uh, mga konkretong bahay. Pero nung sumubok po kami ng GM corn, uh, sabi ko nga jackpot sa mga corn farmer dahil lahat ng mga sumubok ng GM corn ay umangat ang uh, kanilang pamumuhay dahil sabi ko nga mas dumuble yung ani nila uh, mas dumuble din po yung kita nila kaya siguro makikita natin na kami po ay isang uh, successful na corn farmer dito sa Central Luzon dahil nga sa malaking kita at malaking uh, ani na binibigay ng GM corn dito sa amin. Ay gusto ko pong ibahagi sa lahat po ng mga corn farmer po dito sa buong Pilipinas na hindi pa po nakakasubok na magtanim ng GM corn ay huwag po kayong mag-atubili o magdalawang isip na magtanim po dahil dito po nakikita ko yung kaginhawaan na maibibigay sa ating pamilya. Para sa ganon, lahat ng corn farmer dito sa Pilipinas ay aangat ang kanilang pamumuhay. Maraming salamat. Thank you, um, Kajani, Mr. Juanito Rama, for that um, inspiring story. 
uh, we are really happy to see that farmers like you are gaining so much from this uh, modern biotech crop. So indeed, this technology is a promising one. So again, for, um, for the questions, um, you may uh, again type it in the Q&A box and we shall accommodate your questions later at the end of the session. So, okay, for now, um, let's proceed to our next guest for today. So um, our next guest would um, come from Vietnam. So in 2015, um, Vietnam or also started the cultivation of BT corn. So let us now hear how BT corn has impacted the lives of our farmers. May we now call uh, Ms. Vin Dao and Ms. Le Pham, our colleagues from Crop Life Vietnam, to assist our farmers from different provinces of Vietnam, um, namely Mr. Nguyen Can Phong, Mr. Huang Van Tuyen, and Mr. Huang Trong Ngai in sharing their experiences. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Le from Crop Life Vietnam. Uh, <coughs> We are very honored today to have a chance to join and share at the webinar today. And sitting here with me, may I introduce uh, Mr. Nguyen Thanh Phong from Nghệ An, uh, Mr. Hoàng Trọng Ngãi from Vĩnh Phúc, uh, Mr. Hoàng Văn Tuyến from Sơn La, and uh, Mr. Vũ Đài Phương, our interpreter. Uh, before our farmers sharing, we would like to present a short video about GM corn in Vietnam. So uh, let's uh, see it together. Miss um, Emeru, can you help me to play the video? Yeah, we'll ask um, Bowie here from our, from our end. Bowie, can you please help? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Akosi Juanito Kaji. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to talk to the participants of uh, the Farmer Exchange Program I, on the GM Perspective of Pakistan. Uh, this is not this is video. Uh, this is not video. Yeah, not yet. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just wait for a second. <clears throat> Ms. Le, can you share it from your end? Um, do you have your presentation? Uh, let me let me see. Okay, just um, press the share screen button at the bottom of the screen. All right, then there you go. There is no audio. Uh, I'm afraid if I share the video, there is no sound. So okay, can I send the link to you? Yeah, um, can you share it to Crop Life so that we will um, try to assist?
I send you the link. Can you play it from your end? I sent you okay, the here. chat box. Yeah. Bowie, can you? Um, yeah, I can see the see the link in the chat box. Would you like to um, share it in behalf of the Vietnam team? Let's just wait for a couple um, of minutes. Or maybe before sharing. Oh, oh okay. Okay, here it is. Thanks, Bowie. Uh, so firstly, I would like to introduce Mr. Fang. He's the owner of 100 hectare uh, with uh, almost GM corn in Nghệ An. Uh, Mr. Fang, the floor is yours. Xin chào tất cả mọi người. Tôi xin giới thiệu tôi là Nguyễn Thanh Phong, quê là ở Nghệ An. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nguyễn Thanh Phong. I am uh, from Nghệ An province, uh, Việt Nam. Uh, như các bạn đã biết thì là năm 27 tới đây là uh, Việt Nam cũng bị một cái loại xấu là dịch dịch hại đó là cái xấu ăn lá người ta gọi là xấu kéo mùa thu. Uh, you may know that uh, since uh, 2017, uh, for farmers growing corn like us, we uh, have to suffer from um, the uh, four army worm, which is very um, uh, uh, create a lot of damage to us. Vùng đất của tôi sinh sống là tôi làm trên một trăm hecta là ngô chuyển gen. Now I uh, grow uh, one hundred hectare of uh, land uh, with uh, GM corn. Thì là trong cái ngô này thì là cho hiệu quả rất là cao về cái uh, hiệu quả kinh tế cũng như là tác những cái tác động của môi trường. Uh, by uh, growing uh, this uh, GM uh, corn, uh, I can have a lot of uh, economic uh, benefit as well as the environmental uh, benefits. Uh, hiện tại dịch hại cái sâu keo này á, thì nó ăn từ khi bắt đầu trẻ cho đến uh, khi uh, ngố ra. Uh, the uh, four army worms. Uh, uh, start uh, investing our crops since when uh, the corn uh, start to take shape until it uh, grow. Cho nên là việc phòng trừ rất khó và cũng như là nó hiệu quả nó tốn tốn về kinh tế cho người uh, trồng ngô. So fighting against uh, four army worm uh, is very difficult and it uh, costs a lot of money. À, cho nên là từ năm 28 cho đến nay thì gia đình chúng tôi là trong 100 hecta là ngô phải chuyển ren để là à, sản xuất là bán cho à, công ty <cười> sửa tay hát bằng là sinh khối. And uh, so since uh, nay uh, since 2018 uh, two years ago uh, we started to uh, plant uh, uh, GM corn in uh, 100 hectare of land and we sell the uh, product for a milk uh, a dairy company uh, 
named TH in Vietnam. Và cho hiệu quả kinh tế cao, cho nên là chia sẻ để cho các bạn biết. Thứ nhất là không bị phun thuốc trừ sâu. Thứ hai là về cái cỏ dài thì cũng chỉ cần là mình phòng trừ một lần. Đấy, thì là hiệu quả kinh tế là cao hơn cái giống ngô thường. And uh, I uh, have um, a very good economic uh, benefit, so I would like to share with you that uh, uh, if we uh, grow uh, GM corn, we do not uh, have to use uh, pesticide. And uh, to control the uh, wheat, the, the grass, we can only use the herbicide just once. Nếu như ở mùa hè mà ở quê tôi mà trồng cái ngô thương á, thì là uh, cái sâu này nó sẽ ăn lá và nó sẽ phá hại, nó không có thu hoạch. Uh, cho nên là nông dân ở Nghệ An chúng tôi uh, là họ chuyển sang họ dùng cái ngô chuyển gen để là chống chịu với cái loài sâu này. Uh, in summer, uh, in our province, if uh, the farmer uh, grow uh, conventional corn, uh, we uh, cannot uh, have any, uh, um, we, we, we cannot uh, gain anything because of the uh, four armyworm that uh, infest our, that can eat the leaves and uh, the uh, body of uh, the corn. So, Now in, in our province, most of the farmers uh, shifted to uh, have shifted to use um, to, to grow um, GM corn. Uh, trong ngô này thì là nếu như các bạn mà có cả các loài sâu sâu ăn lá, sâu đục thân và sâu đục bắp ấy thì uh, uh, tôi cũng khuyên các bạn là nên sử dụng cái giống ngô chuyển gen này để nó trọng chịu với cái, 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 cái các cái loài sâu và đưa lại cái hiệu quả kinh tế cho người dân đó như là chính là gia đình của tôi chúc là à, các bạn cũng như nông dân là à, thành công khi sử dụng cái giống này. Uh, so uh, I what I recommend for a corn farmer is that if you have um, a corn borer or if you have uh, uh, four army worm uh, in your farm, uh, you just need to uh, use the GM seeds. Uh, and um, it can bring you a benefit for you like uh, it does to my family. And I wish uh, um, all of you, all the farmers, uh, success uh, in uh, growing uh, your crop. Thank you. Secondly, may I, pre uh, may I present Mr. Hoàng Văn Tuyến from Sơn La province. He's not only a farmer with many experience with GM corn, but also the, uh, a provider of GM seed for other uh, farmers in his province. So uh, let's hear uh, from uh, him. Vâng, tôi uh, xin chào các bạn nhé. Uh, good morning, tôi, good afternoon. Tôi uh, là Hoàng Văn Tuyến, hiện nay đang ở Mộc Châu Sơn La của Việt Nam. Uh, my name is Hoàng Văn Tuyến. I am now living in Mộc Châu, uh, Sơn La Province uh, in Vietnam. Tôi là nông dân nhưng là chủ một trang trại uh, bò sữa có diện tích trồng ngô 4 hecta. Uh, I am a farmer and I am also an uh, owner of a cow farm um, and uh, I have a, a, an area of land, a crop land of 4 hecta. Tôi đã tiếp cận tới ngô biến đổi gen này từ 2017. Uh, I started uh, to use uh, GM corn since uh, 2017. Vì gia đình tôi là diện tích đất là nó so với ở trên khu vực tôi ở cũng tương đối là rộng. Thứ hai là gia đình cũng có điều kiện tức là kinh doanh về cái hạt giống này. Nên tôi đã tiếp cận cũng sớm hơn mọi người. Qua quá trình tôi trồng ngô biến đổi gen này nó thấy có những vấn đề rất thuận lợi cho bà con nông dân chúng ta tức là về thời tiết khí hậu thì uh, giống biến đổi gen này nó ok hơn giống thường. Về cái kháng sâu bệnh thì uh, tôi theo dõi thì nó kháng như ở trên tôi nó kháng được ba loại sâu. Cái thứ nhất là sâu đục thân, thứ hai là sâu đục trái và vừa rồi là 2017 trên tôi nó xuất hiện cái sâu keo nữa 
là nó kháng được luôn cả sâu keo nên từ chỗ đó là cái bà con nông dân của mình là nó lợi nhuận cái là không hạn chế sử dụng thuốc bảo vệ thực vật giảm được những cái nhân công chi phí cho phun thuốc bảo vệ thực vật cái thứ hai nữa là thời tiết mình nó có khắc nhiệt hơn mình vẫn có thể trồng được nhưng nếu mà giống ngu thường mà thời tiết là khắc nhiệt mà không cho phép thì có thể là chưa không không khó trồng um, I started uh, uh, accessing um, uh, the, the GM con since uh, 2017 uh, quite earlier compared to other farmers uh, I have a quite a large area of land compared to other farmers and I also um, sell uh, the seeds to other farmers so I started uh, with uh, did, uh, this uh, GM con uh, uh, quite uh, early compared to other uh, farmers in Vietnam. And um, what I uh, observe is that uh, in terms of uh, the climate, uh, the GM con can uh, uh, live well in uh, uh, even harsh uh, climate. And the second is that it can resist against um, all the um, uh, pests that can damage uh, the crop. And uh, for GM corn, uh, at least it can help to uh, resist <coughs> against three types <coughs> of um, uh, pests: the corn borer, the um, uh, the one the, the worm that eat the the corn or the cob, and the four army worms. So um, uh, by using uh, the GM uh, uh, seed, we can uh, uh, reduce. We, we do not have to use uh, pesticide, so we also um, do not have to pay for that, and we do not have to pay for people who help us to um, uh, spray the um, uh, pesticide. Um, and second one is that uh, it uh, can uh, grow in uh, any climate. It's easy, uh, it's easier for us to grow them in uh, different kind of uh, climate. Ngô biến đổi gen khi mà công ty của Việt Nam mà nhập khẩu về thì mà chuyển tới chúng tôi thì mà tiếp cận tới bà con nông dân thì nó rất chậm vì bà con nó bỡ ngỡ với cái giống ngô mới này. Những quá trình tôi là những người tiên phong mà đi trồng ở trên cái đất Sơn La này là trồng sớm nhất. Khi bà con nhìn theo mình mà làm mà nó có hiệu quả sau đó là bà con nông dân của chúng tôi là đã theo tôi để trồng những cái ngô biến đổi gen là càng ngày càng nhiều. Trước khi là một năm có thể tôi chỉ bán được khoảng độ 5 tạ giống thôi. Nhưng hiện tại đến bây giờ là một năm tôi bán tầm khoảng độ 4 đến 5 tấn. 5 000 kg nữa. Uh, at first, um, companies imported uh, uh, GM seeds, GM corn seeds to Vietnam and uh, most of the farmers were not uh, familiar uh, with it. But uh, I uh, was among the first uh, farmers to um, uh, use uh, the GM corn, and uh, uh, I grow uh, GM corn in my land. And uh, farmers around me uh, see what I do and see the productivity and what I get from uh, growing uh, GM corn, and they started um, to uh, grow GM corn as well. And uh, at first, um, I each year I only. Uh, sold about 500 kilograms of seeds but now each year i can sell to other farmers about four to five tons of seeds for other farmers <cười> vâng trong cái ngô biến đổi gen đấy thì nó sẽ đưa lại cho bà con nông dân là cái lợi nhuận rất lớn tức là nếu mà cái công chi phí mà giảm được cái nhân công là nó và thuốc bảo vệ thực vật tầm 3 triệu một hecta. Còn nếu mà cái năng suất của biến đổi gen thì nó sẽ, sẽ đạt nó không bị sâu bệnh thì mình quản lý sâu bệnh thì nó sẽ đạt được khoảng độ 10% nữa. Thì đang dự tính nó vào khoảng độ 10 triệu trên hecta. Um, uh, I see that I can get a lot of economic benefits from growing GM corn. Uh, first, um, we can reduce the cost for pesticide of about uh, 3 uh, billion, uh, 3 million uh, Vietnamese dollars per hectare. 
and uh, we can increase the productivity by about 10%. So for each uh, hectare, we can uh, have um, 10 uh, million uh, Vietnamese dong more, uh, thanks to growing GM corn. Vâng, lợi nhuận như thế thì tại sao mà bà con nông dân mình không trồng? Thế nên là cái biến đổi gen này thì theo tôi thì bà con nông dân chúng ta trên mọi miền đất nước là nên dòng nó. Vâng. Uh, so we can have quite a remarkable economic benefit uh, from growing uh, GM corn. So I hope that, uh, uh, so, so, I, so why should not we uh, use it in our next year uh, farming? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tuyến. And last but not least, uh, may I introduce Mr. Hoàng Trọng Ngãi from Vĩnh Phúc. Uh, Mr. Ngãi is, the, is a farmer leader. He is responsible for 120 hectare of GM corn in his cooperative. And uh, he's also responsible for guiding other farmer in his cooperative to plant GM corn. Uh, uh, please, uh, Mr. Uh, let's hear from Mr. Hoàng Trọng Ngãi. Chào. Hello. Tôi uh, tên là Hoàng Trọng Ngãi. Tôi đến từ Đức Bắc, Sông Lô, Vinh Phúc, Việt Nam. Uh, my name is Hoàng Trọng Ngãi. I come from uh, uh, Đức Bắc uh, Commune, uh, Sông Lô District and uh, Vinh Phúc Province of Vietnam. Địa phương của tôi là nằm trên ven vùng sông Lô, đất màu bãi. Từ trước năm 2015 thì thường thường chúng tôi vẫn là trồng ngô thường. Um, our land is around uh, a very well known river in Vietnam, Lô River. And uh, before uh, 2015, we only grew uh, conventional corn. Từ khi, từ năm, sau năm 2015, Chúng tôi chuyển sang trồng ngô biến đổi gen. Uh, we uh, uh, started um, growing uh, GM corn uh, after 2015. Qua quá trình trồng ngô biến đổi gen, chúng tôi thấy ngô biến đổi gen nó có những cái đặc tính rất là tốt và phù hợp với người dân. Là gọi là đó là một cái quý để mà người dân phát triển sản xuất. Một là cái tính kháng chịu các loại sâu bệnh hại trên ngô. Hai là cây con khỏe phát triển mạnh. Cái thứ ba là chống chịu được các yếu cố tố ảnh hưởng của điều kiện thời tiết thiên nhiên. Uh, we see uh, many benefits uh, from uh, growing GM corn. First, it can resist to... Uh different types of um, uh, pests. The second one is that uh, the corn uh, is very strong and it can uh, develop uh, very well. And the third is that it can be uh, uh, adaptable to uh, uh, different uh, climates. Do đó không phải sử dụng nhiều thuốc bảo vệ thực vật trong quá trình thông canh cây ngô đem lại hiệu quả kinh tế cao cho người nông dân. And uh, we uh, do not have a much, uh, have to use much uh, pesticide, and we can uh, have uh, a lot of uh, economic uh, benefits for farmers. Đồng thời vì không bảo, không phải sử dụng nhiều thuốc bảo vệ thực vật, thì bảo vệ tốt cái môi trường sống của người làm nông nghiệp. And as we do not have to use much uh, pesticide, we can protect the environment for farmers. Thông qua cái sản xuất. Chúng tôi xin chúng tôi rút được một số kinh nghiệm như thế này. Một là tuân thủ cái quy trình kỹ thuật của công ty giống. Cái thứ hai là tuân thủ cái lịch gieo trồng của địa phương. Cái thứ ba là cố gắng đảm bảo cái mật độ trồng để mà đem lại hiệu quả cao trong quá trình sản xuất của người nông dân. Uh, so what I recommend for farmers when uh, uh, they grow GM uh, corn is that first uh, they have to follow the uh, technical instructions 
from the company that provide us the seeds. The second one is that we have to uh, um, be uh, uh, strict with uh, the schedule of uh, sowing the seeds. And the third is that we have to have a very reasonable density uh, when we uh, grow, uh, when we sow the seeds on the land. Từ ngày sản xuất cây ngô biến đổi gen do điều kiện về hiệu quả được nâng cao, cũng như cải thiện cơ bản cái cuộc sống của người nông dân. And uh, since when we started uh, growing uh, GM corn, uh, our life, uh, our livelihood have been uh, improved uh, quite well. Quá trình đưa cây ngô biến đổi gen vào sản xuất thì người dân là rất yên tâm và coi là muốn phát triển nhiều nữa. Uh, and uh, the people are happy with uh, the GM corn and they want to uh, develop it uh, even further uh, in the future. Well, xin, xin trọng, cảm ơn. Thank you very much. So that's all from our end. If you have any question for our farmers, please feel free to raise it in the Q&A part. Thank you. The floor is back to you, Ms. Emeru. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you all for your time. So. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences in Vietnam, stressing also about the importance of following the technical guidance provided by different companies and of course if there are some which came from the government. And also um, thank you for stressing about the economic benefit um, of GM corn there in Vietnam in order to also to combat the pest that you mentioned. You mentioned about the Asian corn border and the fall army worm. So thank you again. And then now, um, let's now proceed to the next section of our um, session. So for the last um, speaker, as most of you already know, um, there are only a few biotech crops which are already approved here in um, Asia for cultivation. So far, some farmers in our neighboring countries still do not have this access yet to these crops. So for now, we have a video of a progressive farmer from Pakistan. He's a corn, cotton, wheat, and wheat farmer who really wants to have access to these biotech crops. Let us hear what he has to say. So ladies and gentlemen, let us all listen to Mr. Amir Hayat Bandara from Pakistan. Good day ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to talk to the participants of uh, the Farmer Exchange Program on the GM Perspective of Pakistan. This is Amir Hayat Bandara, I'm a farmer by profession and uh, the founder of the Agriculture Republic. Agriculture Republic is recognized as a farmer support network for finding innovative policy and practical solutions to national food security and climate change challenges. Uh, as an open, inclusive and multi-stakeholder policy uh, discussion and consultation community it is influencing the agriculture policy at the local and the national level uh, before starting my presentation let me just uh, request you to please uh, stay safe as it is COVID and uh, uh, take care of yourself and your loved ones use masks and uh, uh, after using masks and the protection equipments, please uh, manage the, the, the waste properly as it is contributing the pollution and particularly in the developing countries where we have a very limited access to uh, the security of, of, of the public health. So we need to be very careful by contributing a little in the pollution. Uh, let me start my presentation um, on the GM perspective of Pakistan. If um, I'm going to discuss the geographic position of Pakistan, we have 88 million hectares of area. Our population is increasing at 1.8% annually with 220 million people. Um, our GDP growth is 2.4% uh, uh, and contributing uh, 20 to 22% in the national gross domestic project, uh, uh, product. Uh, uh, our arable land, we have 22 million hectares. Uh, we are uh, the major growers of wheat, cotton, rice, corn, fruit orchards, sugarcane, and sunflower. Uh, we have four seasons, um, but unfortunately, due to the air pollution smog, we are actually facing a threat that is the fifth season of smog. 
uh, if I am going to discuss the corn market of Pakistan, we have 1 million hectares of cultivated area producing approximately 4.9 million tons of corn, uh, which is being used in poultry feed, silage, uh, for dairy, wet millers like Rafan maize go, and food. Uh, if uh, we are going to discuss the corn market transition, in spring um, season of 1990, we were producing uh, around uh, 40 months uh, per acre, um, which is now due to the contribu contribution of uh, uh, good seeds and no doubt the good agricultural practices by the farming community, we are reaching at 100. Uh, from per acre and same with the autumn autumn corn we we were yielding around 20 in 1990 and in 2020 after 30 years we are rating at 70 but again it is subject to the good practices and the good seeds available for the country uh, the corn grain consumption 70 percent is being utilized in in in, in the uh, poultry feed 10 percent in dairy uh, 10 percent in flowers five percent for uh, uh, for other purposes and five percent for food uh, the country as the population is expanding the poultry growth rate is eight to ten percent in 2018 and 19 the silage industry growth rate is now 13 percent so it is very important to enhance the production of the existing crop not by the area but the crop productivity and the yield per acre um, the regulation authorities and biosafety laws we have ministry of climate change um, environment protection authority uh, agency, uh, Ministry of Food Security and Research with the National Biosafety Guidelines 2005 and we have Pakistan Biosafety Rules 2005. Uh, there are three tier system and later two stage of field trials for the biotech cultivation approval process. The three tier system has Institutional Biosafety Committee technical advisory committee and later the national biosafety committee then uh, for the feed trials we have first small scale confined field trials and then the large scales multi-location field trials event then in the end the event and variety hybrid approval system <coughs> sorry uh, the ongoing research on indigenous transgenic crops in Pakistan are going through um, National Institute of uh, Genomics and Advanced Biotechnology, oh, um, overdoing maize, wheat, brassica, uh, potato, groundnut, tomato, and chickpea. Center for Excellence in My Molecular Biology is uh, working on maize, cotton, sugarcane, and potato. National Institute of Biotechnology and Genetic Engineering is working on wheat, tobacco and cotton. University of Agriculture Faisalabad is um, going for wheat and sugarcane. Ayub Agriculture Research Institute Faisalabad is uh, doing for wheat, cotton, sugarcane and brassica. Comsearch Institute of uh, Information Technology Islamabad is going for peas. Foreman Christian College University Lahore is working on wheat for increased of ferrous and zinc bioavailability, increasing phosphorus use efficiency in wheat, enhancing Big fertilizer house. use efficiency in the wheat. Uh, let's have a bird eye view on our regulatory system. Biosafety laws were introduced in 2005. Uh, there is a three tier approval system as al already uh, discussed in IBC, TIC, and NBC. Later event and variety hybrid approval process. Ministry of Climate Change is looking for event pro approval. Ministry of Food Security is um, uh, taking care of hybrid adaptability and registration process. Um, the biotech crops in Pakistan, if we just have a quick view, Pakistan is a, a pro bio biotech country. ISAAA report maintains and mentions that Pakistan is a major largest grower of BT cotton and Ministry of Food Security and Ministry of Climate Change um, are supportive for introduction of the biotech crops in, in Pakistan uh, for the textiles uh, and other uh, products. Um, the regulatory and registration statuses uh, 
the review and the approval process is a bit slow uh, government still uh, deliberating on gm policy for the country after uh, spending millions of public and private investments on gm crops particularly on maize research and development uh, there are some major challenges uh, in biotech um, the regulatory challenges because lack of stability in the regulatory structure policy uh, challenges have a conducive policy on commercialization of biotech products uh, to meet the country's growing food and feed demands uh, and also attract the foreign investment enforcement of uh, IPRI laws in biotech and seed business we are actually lacking in awareness among stakeholders including farmers and including all the stakeholders on board and they are really uh, unaware about the benefits to the end users as well uh, there is also a challenge by anti-government uh, anti-gm groups and individuals and um, as um, according to the discussion majority is not science and evidence-based uh, we need to enhance uh, acceptance of biotech with focus on socio-economic and environmental benefits this is the most important reason we need to work on it we need to build the capacity of regulators and stakeholders of of all the players of the value chain and we need to actually build collaborations with public sector biotech institutions and other stakeholders uh, and then thank you very much for your patience and listening to my presentation. Um, thank you, Mr. Amir. So um, definitely, um, we're um, here to um, hope you hope you we will have some developments in Pakistan soon, and also. Um, hope the advocacies in Pakistan would um, go well in the near future. Okay, so um, let's wait for a minute. Okay, so this time, um, let's have our Q&A. So sorry, um, time check, it's already 2.27, so kindly bear with us. Um, so for the Q&A, this is our, for the last Three sharers, Mr. Um, Juanita Rama, Kajani, hope you're still there. Um, and also for the Vietnam um, Vietnam team and um, Mr. Amir. Okay, so for everyone who wants to ask questions or send a comment or regarding their experience, again, kindly um, type in the Q&A box. Okay, so let me check. Maybe we can have um, two, um, two questions. Um, from an anonymous attendee. So to Mr. Um, Jani Rama, Kajani, can you hear me? Hello, hello. Yes. Okay. Hello, ma'am, okay. okay? I can hear you, ma'am. Okay. So um, the question is that, how did you encourage your friends and relatives who are also corn farmers to use GM corn? I introduced uh, JM corn to our relatives, especially our uh, and our friends here in the Philippines to plant uh, JM corn so that uh, we harvest uh, too much on our expectation. Thank yeah, you. So, yeah, thank you, Kajani. So definitely experiences the... Um, the best thing that um, um that would really encourage everyone to also um plant the GM corn here in the Philippines. And another um question that we have um so this also for you um uh, Kajani. <laughs> um do you have um fall army worm problems in your corn farm? If you do, what do you do to manage it? Uh yeah, we encounter the pole army worm by using uh, uh, other seeds that is GM also, but uh, not uh, protected by pole army worm. So uh, we use uh, insecticide to 
uh, control the full armor worm, which is uh, registered in FPA. Thank you. Um, Kai Jenny for that. So, um, fall army worm. I'm hearing some questions even um, back in the day one. So it's a uh, um, an emerging concern here in the Philippines as well and um, in other um, neighboring countries. Okay. So sorry if um, we don't have much time, but again, for, for the other questions, we will try to answer this again via the Q&A box or if we have already um, finished with this, um, this program, um, please expect for an email. Okay. Okay. So I think, yeah, so that's the end of the, um, of the session for, um, for the sharing of the pharmacy. Again, thank you. Thank you. But then um, now before we um, we continue with the super fun part of the session, may we just um, um, take a minute or two of your time to answer our evaluation poll. So the poll will be flashed on your screen and you just have to click on your feedback for this session. Okay, can is it? Okay, so for, we only have one, okay. <laughs> for the sharing of experiences in commercial growing of biotech crops, so this is a multiple choice. So kindly click if you um, are um, extremely satisfied, satisfied, or it's just an average, dissatisfied, or extremely dissatisfied. And then um, kindly click submit. Okay, so hope um, the remaining 47 attendees would um, really help us um, in having this feedback. Okay, so 30 more seconds, 75% have already voted. All right. Thank you, everyone. 100%. <laughs> okay. Um, so again, thank you for the feedback. So we will use this, of course, to improve and better our future webinars. Okay, for the conclusion, um, to conclude this session, I would again like um, to extend our thanks and appreciation to our dear speakers. It is, it is always, um, it warms uh, my heart whenever I hear stories from our dear farmers about the application of the GM crops, such as, um, as you mentioned, sugarcane, canola, corn in different countries, and the benefits that um, you get from the technology, and most importantly, the impact of their lives, of, in their lives. So hope more and more farmers from our neighboring countries could also experience what the GM countries are experiencing. As I mentioned during the start of the session, our farmers are our modern day heroes. And nowadays, highlighting the importance of agriculture to provide food in our table, more and more and more people would be really be like you. Okay. Um, so for the last part of the program, so this is an exciting part. So um, again, We'll be um, giving away a $20 shopping vouchers. So um, hope you're all awake, <laughs> still awake. Mm -hmm. The mechanics are simple. So we will um, show one question and you have to type the answer on the chat box. So now in the chat box on your screen, the first three persons to get the correct answer wins. Okay, so again, we will be flashing the question and then kindly type your answer on the chat box. So the first three persons will win. Okay. Are you now ready? Yes. Yeah, All right. <laughs> so let's do the countdown in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So the question. Which of the following countries does not plant yet biotech corn? A, Australia, 
B, Philippines. C, Vietnam. D, Pakistan. E, all of the above. F, none of the above. Okay. I can see some answers here. Okay. Summertime. Okay, so I think we only have two winners for now. So maybe, uh, yeah, I just need to scroll back. Um, for the answer, so it's A, Australia. But then, um, let me check. Um, so the winners are Nippon and Elaine. So sorry for... Uh, for for the others but then thank you again for for joining um for joining our iraffle okay so um but um before before we end let me invite you again for tomorrow so same link and same time so 1 p.m philippine time tomorrow is already last the last day of our program we'll we will be having a virtual tour of the philippine rice research institute gene bank and the Corteva seed processing plant. Okay, so for the winners again, congratulations. So we will get in touch with you through an email on how to claim your prize. Okay, so once again, um, thank you. And um, it's an overtime, so thank you again. I'm Mimi, I'm Maria M. Ruby Rodriguez, and I'm your moderator, so see you again tomorrow. Thank you. What? <laughs>